Thanks for praying for me. It's just so glad to be with you today. The year was 1863. The United States was in the middle of the American Civil War. In that year, October of 1863, President Abraham Lincoln issued a decree that the fourth Thursday of November would be a national day of Thanksgiving, a holiday that we continue to celebrate this very day. In establishing that holiday, President Lincoln wrote a proclamation in 1863 to the American people. Now imagine this. There's an actual war happening on the soil of this country. And amid that actual war that would last another two years, President Lincoln called the American people to be thankful. In this proclamation, he begged a war-weary nation to acknowledge and say thanks to God for all the blessings that the country had known. He identified fruitful fields food being provided for the nation in the midst of the war, and other things. And he goes on to say that these gifts, the many gifts that the people had then, which are so constantly in joy, listen to this, that we are prone to forget the source from which they come. President Lincoln was so right that we can forget the source of the blessings those, that source for my blessings is not me, it's not my wife, it's the Lord God. And even though we are blessed in ways that are, we just can't even begin to number, we'll forget that. We'll forget that. President Lincoln went on to say that there are other gifts that have been added, of which are so extraordinary a nature that they cannot fail to penetrate and soften the heart which is habitually insensitive to the gifts that God has given them. I'll tell you what's interesting to me about this proclamation and the year that it was given is that President Lincoln felt that Thanksgiving was the way to heal a divided nation. That's never crossed my mind. I think about our nation not as badly divided, but not far off. Is President Lincoln right? Thanksgiving can be healing and restorative? I believe the answer to that is yes. We've begun a two-month sermon series called Live to Give. From now until the end of October, we're doing a deep dive as a congregation into exploring the giving life. The mindset of gratitude, I want to tell you today, the mindset of gratitude is the driving force and fuel of a giving life. You will not be able to give very long or very deeply without a heart filled with gratitude. I am indebted to Dr. Steve Traziak, an elder from this church, and Dr. Anthony Mazzarelli, authors of the book Wonder Drug, Seven Scientifically Proven Ways That Serving Others is the Best Medicine for Yourself. This is a book many of us are reading and a lot of us are discussing in small groups. Through their careful study and research, these two doctors have uncovered truths about the healing and restorative power of giving. Now, I believe this. All truth is God's truth. All truth is God's truth, no matter where it is found. Truth can be uncovered in a lab. Truth can be uncovered, as Steve did, by poring over peer-reviewed studies and discovering truth there. All truth is God's truth, and it's no less truth than what we find when we study the Word of God. And God's truth, whenever we encounter it, in Scripture or from other sources, what we are obligated to do, what we have to do, is to align ourselves to that light. We have to bend our lives to the light of that truth. As your pastor, I tell you that my aim for us as a congregation is to excel in giving of every kind. Financial giving, yes, but not just financial giving. The giving of forgiveness. The giving of your concern. The concern for for the poor. The concern for the addicted. The concern for those who are depressed and suicidal. 
I want us to excel in every and all forms of giving, particularly now as we emerge from this long pandemic. Tom Rayner is a consultant to pastors and churches, and he is in touch with churches and ministries all across the country. He noted last year the following, that only outwardly focused churches will survive the disruption of the last two and a half years. Tom Rayner wrote this, for years, many congregations have acted like religious country clubs. Members paid for services and got perks and benefits. However, churches with a country club mindset made almost no effort to reach and serve their communities. Then he says this, if churches are not making focused, intentional, and regular efforts to reach their communities, they will die. I believe Tom Rayner's right. And that's why you need to understand that your pastors are committed to making us healthy. And a healthy church is a giving church. And a healthy church is driven by the fuel of gratitude. Now, in order for gratitude to be unleashed in our lives, we're going to learn from our scripture lesson today about certain virtues qualities of life, ways that we think, speak, and act, virtues, that we are to wear like a suit of clothing. And because as we wear these virtues, it will affect the way we see one another in our congregation. Because how we see each other determines how thankful we are for each other. So I want you now to listen to the Word of God as it's found in Colossians chapter 3, Verses 12 through 17. Listen to the word of God. Since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourselves with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you so you must forgive others. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ, that, let the peace that comes from Christ, rule in your hearts. For as members of one body, you were called to live in peace and always be thankful. Let the message about Christ and all its riches fill your lives Teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom he gives. Sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. And whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father every step of the way. Would you pray with me for the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ our Lord? And would you pray for those who are sitting next to you? Let us pray. Lord, there was a woman named Lydia who lived in the Roman city, the Roman colony of Philippi. One morning, she sat by the banks of a river near where she lived, and she heard the Apostle Paul speak your word. And you opened her closed heart. Lord God, I pray for myself and for these whom I love so much that you would do that miracle today to open our hearts to your word. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts, may they be acceptable in your sight, for you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Mike Goodwin is a Christian comedian. He is hilarious. He grew up in South Carolina. In one of his routines, he talks about some of the unusual words that he heard from family and neighbors as a boy. These made-up words are words, for instance, like fixin'. I'm fixin' to do this. I'm fixin' to do that. But Mike's favorite word that he heard mostly in his home is a five-syllable word, and I want to show you part of a clip from his, rut his routine. Let's watch this. Matter of fact, my favorite word is a made-up word. It's five syllables. One word. What you're not going to do. <laughs> yeah, my mother said that a lot when I was growing up. <laughs> my mother said stuff like, what you're not going to do is keep running in and out of this house. That's what you're not gonna do. What you're not gonna do is stand in front of that refrigerator 
to hold that door open. <laughs> Little boy. That's what you're not going to do. Y'all can use it at your job. You know, you go to work. You got that coworker that always asking you questions before you get settled. You're like, what you're not going to do is come in here and ask me questions before I turn on my computer. That's what you're not going to do. That's what, <laughs> what you're not going to do. What you're not going to do. One word, five syllables. The Apostle Paul coined a similar word as he wrote to the believers in Colossae. What you're not going to be. One word. What you're not going to be as a congregation is you're not going to be filled with greed and you're not going to worship the things of this world. That's not what you're going to be. As God's people, you're not going to be, what you're not going to be is filled with lust or greed or rage or bitterness. That's what you're not going to be. What you're not going to be is angry and impatient and arrogant as a church. No, that's not what you're going to be. Here's what you are going to do. Here's who you are going to be. First, you're going to do this. You're going to put on a new set of clothing. So listen again to Colossians 3, 12 through 14. This is from the message, paraphrase. Since you have been chosen by God for this new life of love, dress, clothe, put on the wardrobe or the clothing God has picked out for you. Here it is. Compassion, kindness, humility, quiet strength or patience, discipline. Be even-tempered, content with second place, quick to forgive an offense. And regardless of what else you wear, wear love. It's your basic all-purpose garment. Never be without it. Never leave home without it. Now, we live in days with plentiful, inexpensive clothing. Sometimes more expensive, mostly inexpensive. So we've kind of lost touch with really what the purposes of clothing, what they're really about. And we have forgotten that through most of human history, most people have had very few articles of clothing. Some of us live in homes that were built 60 years ago, 70 years ago, 100 years ago. They don't have any closets, right? I mean, they have no closet space whatsoever. Why? Because people didn't have that many clothes way back when. Now, at the time when Paul wrote these words, people had maybe... Two articles of clothing, that's it. And so writers like Paul in the Bible often would refer to putting on your clothing as something that you do as a daily part of your life. That's still true for us, right? We just have more choices in terms of the clothing we wear. You wear clothing to protect yourself from the heat or from the cold. You wear clothing to, for the sake of modesty. But in the same way, think of putting on clothing. You just don't do it. It's, you know, there's not a day when you don't put on clothing. In the same way, put on these virtues that Paul names in Colossians chapter 3. Compassion. Kindness. Patience. Love. Let's unpack the word um, compassion for a second. Compassion is a feeling of deep concern, a desire to help, a desire to do something about somebody who's in pain. Physical pain, relational pain, spiritual pain. Even when they're in pain from the sin they have committed, compassion is a heartfelt, deep response to a person who is in pain. Now, I'll tell you what's interesting about these lists of virtues, things we're to put on every single day. And by the way, you do have a choice of the clothing that you wear because you can put on those virtues we name, or you put on vices too, like complaints and bitterness and entitlement. And some of us wear that clothing every single day of our lives without fail. But here's the thing I want you to think about with me because it struck me. Well, what exactly is gratitude? Because gratitude is not listed as a virtue to put on. So what is gratitude? Is gratitude an emotion, a mood, a virtue, an action, a prayer? Yes. It's all the above. I call gratitude a mindset. And I call gratitude a practice, a way in which we live. Dr. Robert Edmonds, a professor of psychology at UC Davis, defines the grateful person in this way. 
A grateful person is one who regularly affirms the goodness in his or her life. Gratitude begins by recognizing the goodness that's in your life. That's the first part of the definition. Then he says, and, um, and the, the sources of this goodness lie at least partially outside of themselves. That's the other part of gratitude. Recognizing you're not the author of the blessings in your life. I'm not either. This makes me think of one of my favorite quotes outside of the Bible that has really shaped my life for years by Thomas Merton. Thomas Merton said this, to be grateful is to recognize the love of God in everything. And he has given us everything. Every breath we draw is a gift of his love. Every moment of existence is a grace for every moment brings with it immense graces from him. Gratitude, therefore, takes nothing for granted, is never unresponsive, is constantly awakening to new wonder and praise to the goodness of God. For the grateful person knows that God is good, not by hearsay, but by experience. The grateful person knows that God is good firsthand, not because their parents told them about it, not because they read about it in a book, not because a preacher told them so. The grateful person knows God is good firsthand. That's the promise of gratitude at work in your life. Now, it's good to be around grateful people, is it not? You're around somebody who's grateful, that's going to be the best part of your day. And grateful people, man, they just know how to give. I mean, they give, and they're happy to give. You know, and they're easy to be with, and they're happy, and they're generous, and they're just good to be with. Ungrateful people, man, I don't want to spend more than three minutes with them. I mean, they're a drag. They zap my energy. They give me a headache. Without fail, ungrateful people are complainers, who constantly criticize. They are forever bitter, regularly angry, and always convinced that they deserve better than this. Man, I can't take three minutes with a person like that. Now, to be grateful, Paul instructs us in the Word of God, is not just about the things you have. That's good. Please do be grateful for that, because all of us have so much. But this gratitude is directed, I believe, towards people, and particularly people in the church. So right now, look right and look left and be grateful for the person who is on either side of you. And remember that the practicing of our virtues, putting on our virtues, including forgiveness, will automatically expand my gratitude for each other. If I don't have virtues like patience, love, kindness, compassion, if I'm wearing something else, I'll never be grateful. But if I'm wearing those things, suddenly I'll be a whole lot more grateful for the people in my life. This church family, yes, by all means, but even the people you live with who are always harder to be grateful for, Spouses, parents, kids, grandkids, uncles, the rest. Now, according to Drs. Traziak and Massarelli, when gratitude was directed to other people, they were highly motivated to continue unselfish behaviors that would lead to more interpersonal gratitude. In other words, what they're saying, I believe, and ask Steve afterwards if I'm right, but the more grateful you are for people in your life, and especially the people who are pains in the neck. That's the miracle of this passage, is that by wearing these virtues, a person, you just like, I can't stand that person, even if they're ungrateful, suddenly you're going to have the capacity to be at least somewhat grateful for them, to find one thing you're grateful for about them, and that's better than nothing. Steve and Dr. Maz go on to say this. Thankfulness for a specific person beats generalized gratitude for turning you into to a live to giver. So these two doctors prescribe the following practice for us. That is to intentionally write this week 
a handwritten note, yes, people still write those, handwritten note or an email to somebody, and to express in detail what you're grateful for for them, what you admire, what you respect. And when you write that note, I want you to think long and hard about what's, what you are thankful for. What is it about that person that you're thankful for? And I want you to write with lots and lots of details. Because here's the deal, parents, this is really true for us. We tend to criticize in detail. You did not get that corner of the lawn when you cut the grass. And let me tell you, you did a lousy job of cutting the side yard, and you didn't trim all the rest of that. We go into chapter and verse detail with our criticisms. But then we'll say, good job cutting the grass. Something wrong with that, my friends. We need to switch. The details we are giving are related to how we see and love each other. And when we love somebody, we are experts in them, and we're looking for the details of what we are grateful for about them. Brene Brown, best-selling author, many of you have read her, as I have, a social researcher, said that she found in her research over the span of 12 years that she did not interview one person who described themselves as joyful who did not actively practice gratitude. These folks shared common, tangible Gratitude practices. Some of them kept a gratitude journal. Many of you do that. If you do, great. Let me encourage you to write down what you're grateful for and share it with somebody else. And then she shared this great idea. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, right? First four numbers. At 1234 every day, they said something out loud that they were grateful for in their lives. Set your phone and do that tomorrow. 1234, something out loud to somebody else, what you're grateful for. It's not joy. It's not joy that makes us grateful. It's gratitude that makes us joyful. It's not joy that makes us grateful. It's gratitude that makes us joyful. A joyful church is a giving church. A giving church makes a kingdom mark for the glory of God in this time, in this place. Friends, let's sign up for it. What do you say? May it be so. Amen. Our band's going to come and lead us in in our closing song. Thank you.